Wow, it's great to see everybody coming in. Welcome. It's wonderful to see such a great turnout. Not surprising because we have some fabulous poets reading today and a big announcement. So we're going to let people come in through the waiting room uh, for a couple more minutes and then we'll get started. Uh, Lucas, can you make sure that our speakers can unmute themselves? Well, people coming from Seattle and Pittsburgh and New York and Georgia. Michigan, Illinois, it's great. You will find that you are all muted. We will take questions in the chat later on. Um, and comments from the chat. Welcome. So I think that we will get started even though there are people still coming in. I'm Meg Weston, if you don't know me already, and I want to welcome everyone this afternoon. It's an exciting afternoon on the Poets' Corner. We have three distinguished poets joining us to read. Richard Blanco, Carrie Fountain, and Rajiv Mohabir. I'm just thrilled that they are here today and that we'll hear from them. And we also want to start with a very exciting announcement. So this is this year we had the first ever Maine Media and the Poets Corner Poetry Chapbook Contest. And I want to thank the folks at Maine Media for collaborating with us on that. And I think a couple of people are here representing Maine Media. Uh, Rafi Baeza, who's the Director of Marketing and probably Richard Bright Smith, who is the Chair of the Book Arts Program and the Studio Manager for the Charles Altschul Studio for Book Arts. And he is also the designer and printer of the letterpress edition for the winning chapbook. So I also wanna 
give a special thanks to my friend, Jim Zimprich, who very generously is the donor who, who contributed to make it possible for us to run the contest, to engage Naomi Shehab Nye as our contest juror, and to grant a $1,000 prize to the winner. We received more than 250 submissions to this contest, and I wanna thank everybody who submitted. There were so many wonderful, wonderful works of art, and our readers read every single one of them. Um, and um, our readers are anonymous, but they are poets themselves, thoughtful readers. They gave real thought and attention to all of these submissions. And I wanna thank them very, very much. Out of all 250, we were able to, not easily, but we were able to select 10 that were our finalists. And we believe that each of these chapbooks were worthy of publication and were, you know, just we'd be proud to put our names behind any one of them. And I want to read the names of the chapbook finalists. And I think many of them are on today. So we had 10, Spiracle, Spiracle Grove by Monique Avakian, Ella's Plan by Jeffrey Bean, Arrivals by Ali Cruz, Last Postcards by Lynn Ellis, The Beautiful Foolishness of Things by Sandra Hutchinson, A Lexicon of Snow by Angela Long, Sky Burial and Other Love Poems by Catherine Marenghi, Dragon Love by Marita O'Neill, Spit Take by Peter Spagnuolo and Fox's Sleep by Megan Sterling. From those 10 finalists, Naomi Shehab Nye selected three, two honorable mentions and our prize winner. And the honorable mentions were last postcards by Lynn Ellis, and Arrivals by Ali Cruz. So congratulations to both of you for that selection. And our winner is Ella's Plan by Jeffrey Bean. And I have to say that I wanna congratulate all of you. Everyone who submitted a a chapbook is a winner by having done the work and put it forward um, in many ways. And But I want to congratulate uh, Jeffrey. You know, all the work was read anonymously, and there was such enthusiasm about this chapbook, Ella's Plan. And Naomi wrote this. I want to read what she wrote about it. Ella's plan is mesmerizing, embodying the real presence of an imaginative, eccentric, tender, daydreamer child. I felt riveted by the series of exquisite poems with such potent, occasionally chilling, as in the unforgettable poem, Truths About an Abusive Babysitter, Images. I could not look away from these magical poems. I felt I had known and treasured this child all my life, but never read this much about her before. I felt these poems rising out of deepest understanding and care for the outcast, the wayward creative. I adore them. There would be no way for this not to be the winner. I can imagine how utterly sensational this chapbook will be and can't wait to hold it in my hands. And I feel the same way, the, the design that Richard is working on with Jeffrey Bean is just beautiful. 
Uh, Bean will receive a $1,000 prize and 20 copies of his book published by Poetry Press in a limited letterpress edition of 250, designed by Richard Wright Smith and printed in the Charles Altschul Studio for Book Arts at Maine Media Workshops and College. There will be a reading with Jeff and it will be hosted by Naomi Shehep Nye will take place on the Poets Corner on June 12th, so on Zoom, and I hope you will sign up and come back to hear from Jeff on this, and um, sign up on our website, and there will be copies of the chapbook for sale at that time. So congratulations, and what a way to start. So we're going to begin today's program with Richard Blanco. So he probably needs no introduction to this crowd, but I'll do it anyway. Richard's been a part of the Writers Harbor uh, Poetry Week at Maine Media since its inception. I think Richard and I helped brainstorm the idea originally. And this will be the fourth coming up this June, and it will only be the second time it will be in person. So, you know, very shortly after our inaugural launch of uh, Poetry Week at Maine Media, we um, had to go virtual and it's been great, but, um, but I'm glad to be back in person. So Richard was, uh, selected by President Obama as the fifth inaugural poet of the United States. He was the first Latino, first immigrant and gay person to serve in this role. And at the time he was the youngest, he's been, <laughs> uh, somebody oh, yeah. else has taken that order, <laughs> second youngest here. <laughs> he's the author of many award-winning um, poetry collections, including his most recent, How to Love a Country, and one of my favorites, Looking for the Gulf Motel. Uh, also written a uh, memoir. He's in demand as a speaker, teacher, and occasional poet. Not occasionally poet, but occasional poet. <laughs> And uh, he's also the education ambassador of the Academy for American Poets. And I got to see him last as the MC of the gala there last week, which was pretty fabulous. So, uh, you know, he's a wonderful speaker and we're thrilled to have him here today. And I'm also thrilled to call him my friend. So please join me in welcoming Richard Blanco. Thanks, Meg. It is, it is, I am with family here. It seems, got it, a lot of years have passed by. <laughs> um, it's wonderful to be uh, with Main Media College and uh, workshops in college. Uh, it's just such a great place. Um, and um, so thank you, everyone. Um, glad to be reading with, with Carrie and Rajiv and um, looking forward to actually being in person again with both of you uh, for the first time. Um, I guess, uh, speaking of Maine and Maine Media, I thought to read today, I'd, I'd highlight a couple of Maine poems um, that I've written while in Maine, <laughs> and then uh, a couple of uh, poems that are based on photographs, which is what my workshop is going to focus on, is how do we, how, do, how can we mine poems out of photographs, uh, taking ad advantage of uh, Main media's interdisciplinary programming, uh, or at least at least the feel of it, and there's so much so much photography that happens there, along with film and whatnot. Um, so hopefully that that you know sort of gels all together. Anyway, um, here's the first one, which I wrote, I think, because I got tired of people asking me, "You moved to Maine from Miami?" So, <laughs> so this is like kind of like my response to it. Um, thicker than country. A Cuban like me living in Maine? Well, what the hell? Mark loves his native snow, and I don't mind it, really. I love icicles, even though I still decorate the house with seashells and starfish. Sometimes I want to raise chickens and pigs. Wonder if I could grow even a small mango tree in the three-season porch. But mostly, 
I'm happy with hemlocks and birches towering over the house, their shadows like sundials, the cool breeze blowing even in the summer. Sometimes I miss the melody of Spanish a little, and I play Celia Cruz, dance alone in the basement. Sometimes I miss the taste of white rice with picadillo, so I cook, but it's never as good as my mother's. I don't miss her or the smell of Cuban bread as much as I should. Most days I wonder why, but when Mark comes home like an astronaut dressed in his ski clothes, or I spy him planting petunias in the spring, his face smudged with this earth, or barbecuing in the summer when he asked me if I want a hamburg or a cheeseburg, as he calls them, still making me laugh after 20 years. I understand why the mountains here are enough. White with snow or green with palms, mountains are mountains, but love is thicker than any country. Um, this is, despite the title of this poem, which is called Killing Mark. Um, <laughs> it is a love poem. Uh, and uh, this has to do with something uh, very, well, there, it's a Maine poem because it takes place in Maine. But uh, when we first moved there, um, they put the fear of God into you about hitting a moose. So you can imagine a Cuban, like, what, would, what is I don't even know how to say that in Spanish. I learned the word is out of state. But anyway, um, anyway, so this is a poem, but it's really about a rela relationship. And I think all of us have, uh, most of us fall into one of two categories in a relationship. The person that calls all the time and is diligent about that and the person that never calls. <laughs> so I'm the one that always calls. Mark is the one who never calls to let me know what's going on, where he is, et cetera. Uh, and so you'll see my, my neurotic self here. <laughs> Killing Mark. His plane went down over Los Angeles last week again. Or was it Long Island? Boxer shorts, hair gel, his toothbrush washed up on the shore at New Haven. But his body never recovered, I feared. Monday, he cut off his leg chainsawing, bled to death slowly while I was shopping for a new lamp. Never heard my messages on his cell phone. Where are you? Call me. I told him to be careful. He never listens. Tonight, 15 minutes late, I'm sure he's hit a moose on Route 26, but maybe, maybe he survived. Someone from the hospital will call me, give me his room number. I'll bring his pajamas, some magazines. 525, still no phone call, voicemail, full. I turn on the news, wait for the report. Flashes of moose blood, his car mangled as I buzz around the bedroom, dusting the furniture, sorting the sock drawer again. Did someone knock? I'm expecting the sheriff by six o'clock. Mr. Blanco, I'm afraid he'll say, hand me a Ziploc with his wallet, sunglasses, wristwatch. I'll invite him in, make some coffee, 625. I'll have to call his mother, explain, arrange to fly the body back home. Do I have enough bags for his clothes? I should keep his ties, but his shoes? Order flowers, roses, white or red. By 7.30, I'm taking mental notes for his eulogy, suddenly adoring all I've hated, 10 years worth of nose hairs in the sink, of lost door keys, of chewing too loudly and hogging all the bed sheets. When suddenly, Joey, our dog, yowls, ears to the sound of footsteps up the drive and darts to the doorway. I follow him with a scowl. Where the hell were you? You couldn't call, could you? Translation, I die each time I kill you. So one of, one of the things um, that like all our cultures, right? One of the things we miss most is food. Um, and um, moving to Maine um, wasn't exactly like there was a Cuban restaurant <laughs> in every town. Um, but um, I also realized that Part of the legacy is, is learning how to cook. And I realized I don't know how to cook any Cuban dishes. So I invited my mom, who's, who's now 86, because I thought, well, these, these, these dishes will 
die with her. Um, so she came up to Maine and that was part of our thing. She taught me a few dishes and this is the poem from that. <laughs> Cooking with Mama in Maine. Two years since trading mangoes for these maples, the white dunes of the beach for the white mountains etched in my living room window, I asked my mother to teach me how to make my favorite Cuban dish. She arrives from Miami in May with a parka and plantains packed in her suitcase, chorizos, vino seco, and also onions, garlic, olive oil, as if we couldn't pick these up at the Hannafords in Oxford County. She brings with her all the spices of my childhood, laurel, pimenton, dashes of memories she sprinkles into a black pot of black beans starting to simmer when I wake up and meet her already busy in the kitchen. With a pad and pencil eager to take notes, I ask her how many teaspoons of comino or of oregano, cups of oil, um, how much vinegar she's adding. But I can't get a straight answer. I don't know, she says, me, I just know. Afraid to stay in the guest cottage by herself, but not afraid of the blood on her hands as she stabs holes in the raw meat, stuffs in garlic. Six or seven majos menos, maybe seven cloves, she says, it all depends. She dices about one bell pepper, tells me how much my father loved her cooking too. As she cries over about two onions she chops, tosses into a pan, sizzling with olive oil, making sofrito to brown the roast. She insists I just watch her hands, stirring, folding, whisking me back to the kitchen I grew up in. Dinner for six of us on the table, six sharp, every day of her life for 30 years until she had no one left to cook for. I don't ask how she survived her exile, 10 years without her mother, 20 as a widow. Did she grow to love snow those years in New York before Miami? And how will I survive winters here without her cooking? Will I ever learn? But she answers my every question when she raises a spoon to my mouth saying, taste it. Mijo, there's no recipe, just taste. It's right about 10.25, so I don't have time to read one photo poem and then we'll move on. Um, well, since we did mom, we gotta do dad, I guess. <laughs> uh, so this is actually inspired uh, by a very famous poem. Uh, uh, this is not a photo of my Mark uh, Atwood, um, which I remember reading very early in, when I started writing. So it's it's about a photograph that doesn't exist, um, but you feel should exist <laughs> or must might exist, um, or you um, photograph someone forgot to take. It's called Papa at the Kitchen Table. Uh, the epigraph is, my father moved through dooms of love, through seams of am, through halves of give by Cummings. This isn't from a photograph of my father, there's nothing to prove I remember him. Like this, alone at the kitchen table beside a crystal bowl dulled with plastic red grapes, the curtains thin as vellum hung against the morning light, holding back the sun, not yet risen above our terracotta rooftop. And yet I'll be driving on the interstate or mincing onions or reading the newspaper when suddenly there he will be. The same blue striped boxers his hairy legs crossed, waiting for his espresso to brew, the glow of the range, the glow of his cigarette, tapping ashes into the cup of his hand. I can't remember any photo with his elbows on the table, palms clasped around his face like sepals of a flower, leaning into the light of the window, seeing what I imagine he saw, grackles squawking at nothing, the mangoes hanging like brick red hearts, the sundial shadows of light poles across the driveway. Sometimes when I'm shaving, he appears in the mirror, watching the thin white film, the moon in the morning sky vanishing with the life I still wish for him, not the life he had. 
fleeing Cuba to Madrid, $10, one suitcase, winter work at a bomb factory in New York, then a butcher shop in Miami. There's no snapshot of him head bowed to the floor, counting the terrazzo specks, tugging at his eyebrows, thinking what I think he thought, how he'd pay for my tuition, a trip to Disney World he couldn't promise, if he'd ever learn English, ever see Cuba again, the gun I knew he kept under his bed. Even though there's no black and white to prove it, today, as I walk the beach, the sky, the sea, and my life are one with his. The clouds stop and tell me it's all true. The kitchen table, the aroma of his espresso, black, the beams of light piercing him, and his eyes quiet and heavy, moonstones wishing me a good morning every morning. Thank you, everyone. Richard, thank you. That was wonderful. I love the humor in your poems as well as the, the I don't know what you call it, the tenderness, I guess. <laughs> yeah. But, but and you, know, you, know, you, you know Mark, so you yes. know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. It was, yeah. And I just pictured it all coming to mind <laughs> and the little cottage that your mother won't stay in. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, uh, great, great. Well, next up we have Carrie Fountain. And Carrie serves as the Texas Poet Laureate. She's the author of three poetry collections, The Life, Instant Winner, and Burn Lake, which was the winner of the 2009 National Poetry Series Award. She's written the YA young adult novel, I'm Not Missing, and a children's book that sounds just wonderful. I'm going to have to order that, The Poet Forest. Um, she's the host of KUT's This Is Just To Say, a radio show and podcast where she has intimate conversations about the writing life with poets and other writers. She lives in Austin, Texas, and is joining us today from there. However, you'll be able to meet her in person when you sign up for the Writers Harbor Poetry Week. So please join me in welcoming Carrie Fountain. Thank you so much for, uh, for inviting me to be here today and inviting me to Maine this summer. I'm so thrilled. Richard, oh my God, that was so amazing. I loved hearing your poems. That poem about your mother teaching you to uh, cook Cuban food. It, I was raised in my grandmother's Mexican food restaurant and trying to get definitive sort of, I, I was asked to publish um, a recipe for, for red enchiladas in, in an Austin magazine. And I asked my mom, you know, but how, how, many, <laughs> how many garlic cloves? And she really said, one to ten. <laughs> so that is not useful. <laughs> not at all. Right? No, I, love I think I think maybe something they may not want to give away their secret recipe, which they probably do know in their head, but <laughs> oh, in their heart and in their head, yes. Also, when yeah. you when you grow up in a restaurant, things are. I made pozole last weekend, and um, I came home, and I I got this hominy that was like. So like my, my husband was like, how much pozole are you making? <laughs> he said, I don't know about like amounts are really hard for me to gauge because <laughs> I didn't know that like the, you know, cuminas didn't come in like a jug, you know, like there was just a little bit of, <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, I, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm going to read uh, some poems from my new book, my newest book. It was out last year, um, The Life. Um, and strangely enough, I did not know that Naomi was the judge of your contest and all that, and that she wrote all those wonderful words. She appears in my first poem, like magic, Naomi appears. I uh, also, like uh, Richard, am trying to, I tried to find poems to share that kind of 
come out of the practice that I uh, really lean into in my teaching and my you know workshop holding. So these are some poems that kind of come out of um, a practice of uh, daily writing and kind of trying my hardest to pay attention uh, as as best as I can. So um, this poem does the Naomi in this poem is our Naomi. It's called First. There is a holiness in exhaustion, is what I keep telling myself, filling out the form so my TA gets paid, then making copies of it on the hot and heaving machine, writing strong start on a pretty bad poem. And then the children, the baby's mouth opening, going for the breast, the girl's hair to wash tonight, and then comb so painstakingly in the tub while conditioner drips in slick globs onto her shoulders and her discipline chart flaps in the air conditioner at school, taped to a filing cabinet, longing for stickers. My heart is so giant this evening, like one of those moons so full, it's disturbing, so full that if you see it when you're getting out of the car, you have to go inside the house and make someone else come out and see it for themselves. I want everything, I admit. I want a clean heart. I want the children to sleep and the drought to end. I want the rain to come down hard. It's supposed to monsoon, is what Naomi said, driving away this morning. And she was right, it's monsooning. Still, I want more, even as the streets are washed clean and then begin to flood. Even though the man came again today to check the rat traps and said he bet we'd catch the rat within 24 hours. We still haven't caught the rat. So I'm working at the table with my legs folded up beneath me. I want to know what is holy. I do. But first, I want the rat to die. I am thirsty for that death and will drink deeply of that victory, the thwack of the trap's hard plastic jaw. And I will rush to see the evidence, no matter how gruesome, folding my body over the washing machine to see the thing crushed there, much smaller than I'd imagined it'd be, the strawberry large in its mouth. And this is a poem about, um, it's a poem about the lies we tell our children and, and <laughs> and how they, how they come to sort of understand the world and how they come to become their own people. Um, so this poem is called The Parable of the Gifts. My son can't keep the story straight. Is he going to come into my room? He asks his sister warily of Santa Claus. He is so young, he routinely needs to be reminded what to believe. Santa is real. Aliens are not real. Aliens could be real, my daughter says. Yeah, I guess you're right, I say. And Jesus Christ is real, she said, says. Zeus wasn't real. Zeus was a myth, but Jesus Christ was a real man who walked upon this earth, though he was the son of God. So I guess she's made it to the New Testament. In the 100 Bible stories for children she bought last week with her tooth fairy money. Sure you want that one? Her father asked at the checkout. And as an answer, she held the book tightly to her chest. God, sometimes I can see the privacy forming around her, like faint light or like the shimmer of oil as it heats in the pan. And it is a great mystery to me, and it is painful to me, because it is lonely to be a person. And what she is telling us with her 100 Bible stories 
is that she is a person. God, sometimes I step into this life like stepping into a room I can't remember why I entered. And for a moment, I see nothing. I can see nothing. I can see it, a space in front of me that is not yet filled, that could be filled and will be filled. It's simple and elegant without needs, just large enough. And sometimes I understand that's the place my babies came from, were pulled from wailing, and the space my grandmother returned to finally after her long and painful illness. But suddenly too, that morning, with the scent of orange jello still present in the room, she slipped away was pulled, perhaps. And I imagine that's the space I'll enter too when I die. And it's not unpleasant to think of it, an ultimate privacy. Though thinking of my children with spaces of their own into which they will someday disappear is unbearable. It is unbearable. And though it is unbearable, I bear it. That is the agreement into which I enter entered when they arrived. I think maybe I should read ahead to see how the book handles the crucifixion. Or maybe I should just hide the book and pretend I didn't. I don't know, I haven't seen it. Maybe the tooth fairy will bring you more money and you can buy something else. Because God, I am not prepared to let my daughter know how the main character of her story dies. Not yet. She who answers her brother so kindly with such perfect honesty saying, no, the gifts just appear under the tree. It's magic. Though surely by now, she only pretends to believe. Okay, let's see, I had a request. <laughs> I had a request, so I'm gonna stick in this, uh, this one poem called, this is a poem that's like the next, uh, the next holiday after Christmas, it's called Will You? And it happens around uh, Valentine's, uh, Valentine's. It's a poem that starts out making Valentine's, which I love to do with my children, even though they, it drives me like, just, it makes me crazy every time. Will you? When at the end, the children wanted to add glitter to their Valentines, I said, no. I said, nope, no, no glitter. And then when they started to fuss, I found myself saying something my brother's football coach used to bark from the sidelines when one of his players showed signs of being human. Oh, come on now, suck it up. That's what I said to my children. Suck what up, my daughter asked. And because she is so young, I told her I didn't know and never mind. And she took that for an answer. My children are so young when I turn off the radio as the news turns to counting the dead or naming the act they aren't even suspicious. My children are so young, they cannot imagine a world like the one they live in. Their God is still a real God, a whole God, a God made wholly of actions. And I think, they think, I work for that God. And I know they will someday soon see everything and they will know about everything and they will no longer take never mind for an answer. The Valentines would have been better with glitter. And my son hurt himself on an envelope. And then much later, when we were eating dinner, my daughter realized she'd forgotten one of the three Henrys in her class. How can there be three Henrys in one class? I said, and she said, because there are. 
And so before bed, we took everything out again, paper and pens and stamp and scissors. And she sat at the table with her freshly washed hair parted smartly down the middle and wrote, will you be mine, Henry T. And she did it so carefully, I could hardly stand to watch. Um, and I will end with, I'll, I'll read just read, I'm gonna read the last poem in the book. And again, thank you so much for having me and I can't wait to hear you read Rajiv next. Um, the Spirit Asks, this poem is called The Spirit Asks. This is the life with fried eggs. This is the life with Pyrex dishes of many sizes, none of which I purchased myself. This is the life with the boy who'd eat chicken nuggets every meal and the girl who's asked four times this week if she can please clean the cat's ears. They're dirty. No, they're not. This is the life with lives in it so small, we have to put up a sign on the front door. Don't forget the fish or we'd forget the fish. This life, Sometimes I feel myself so deeply inside it, blessed so painfully, so painfully blessed, pushing into it, pushing, and yet I cannot get through. I want too much. I want a God who will save us all and a God who will feel the little heat coming off the candle I lit in the grotto. A God in heaven, but a God here too, you know? I want a God like the one I tell my children about, the one who loves everyone, even Trump. Well, I guess so, yes, even Trump. Please give me a God that exists. That's all I'll ever want. And the spirit says, okay. And I say, really? And the spirit says, yeah, probably, yeah. Thank you so much. Those were wonderful, Carrie. I love them so much. And I love having these great, you know, looks into the life of you and your children and these every day that just come alive in so many ways. Thank you. And the thoughts and as well as the realities and the glitter. I won't forget the glitter. <laughs> Thanks. Um, next, we're gonna have Rajiv. Rajiv Mohabir is uh, last up to read, but certainly not the least in any way. He's a professor at Emerson College. So he's on the East Coast with us. He's the author of three acclaimed poetry collections, The Taxidermist's Cut, Cowherd's Son, and Cultish, a book of translations called I Even Regret Night, and his hybrid memoir, Anti-Man. is winner of too, new, too many prizes and fellowships to mention here. Um, he received his MFA from Queens College and I know in poetry and translation. And that, well, that's an art in itself and a PhD in English from the University of Hawaii. So I'm so thrilled that you're joining us today and that you'll be here for Writers Harbor in Maine. Rajiv. Yeah, thank you so much um, for inviting me here. This is so wonderful to be, you know, in this energy where the, you've announced the winner of this prize. That's so wonderful to begin this, like how lovely. And then also to hear Richard and Carrie both read, like thank you both so much for your poems. Uh, I feel so excited by poetry um, to, and to be here with you. And I'm so, so stoked to come to uh, Maine um, this summer. Uh, and so actually I'm gonna start my reading by uh, reading a, a poem by the Abenaki poet, Joseph Bruchak. Um, and I think that what's, what's, what's really cool about him or this, this poem is that I feel like it, it kind of unites all of our themes together, Richard Carey and myself, um, in that it's about like descent 
as well, the people that we come from and the people that we're making and sending off into the world as well. Um, and uh, another point of uh, interest for me is like, you know, the Abenaki people uh, are native to Maine um, and part of the Wabanaki um, Confederacy that extends down into um, the town Malden that I live in. Um, and uh, uh, I just want to um, acknowledge the fact of uh, the poets on whose land I, I work currently. This poem is called Prince. Prints, as in fingerprints. Seeing photos of ancestors a century past is like looking at your own fingerprints, circles and lines you can't recognize until someone else with a stranger's eye looks close and says, that's you. Um, the, the poems that I'm going to share with you uh, this afternoon or evening or morning, wherever you are, um, uh, are uh, from, uh, you know, this kind of obsession that I have with writing poems, uh, where I've like really cultivated a kind of like extra literary jumping off point in which I can trigger my subconscious mind into bringing something new, some unexplored thing into uh, my, my, my consciousness. Um, and this one poem that I'm reading is called Chutney Mashup. And it's a mashup of different translations of chutney songs uh, that are popular in the Caribbean. Um, and so I'm gonna start with the Hindustani chorus that I'm gonna translate at the very end um, and maybe buckle up for the ride because this is supposed to be like a dance song um, or maybe like several dance songs all interlaced. Chutney Mashup. Aaj sawalya hamna jaybe bithar balama ulat pavan chala gaya chadar bichao You tie your veil to meet me in the courtyard though there no neem tree grows you wrap your limbs tightly about mine as jamun fruits betray their pedestals and stain the concrete with ruby wine The shehnai weeps for us only Inside, my strength has ebbed. Spread a sheet on the earth, Balama, that when weary, we may lie like, that we may lie on silk in peace. Despite your wise restraint, your morals will scatter in a fire dance. What God can save us? I will never escape the body's betrayal. The neighbor women jeer at the stains on my veil. My ruined fabric, I pleat and tuck at my waist. Today, love, I will not go outside. Against the backwards wind, spread a sheet. I really love Chakti music. I really love music in general. And I think that like what that translation um, and kind of mashup allowed me to do was to make connections between these songs that really kind of like spoke to my queer desire. Um, in a way that has been like coded in these songs. And so similarly, I mean, the next poem that I'm gonna read is actually called Bollywood Con Confabulation, which it's, uh, I've taken like maybe five different Bollywood songs, translated them, and then did like a mashup as well. Um, but the, this, is, this is like trades in the high drama of Bollywood. So here we go. Look at your feet, so beautiful. Do not step on the ground. Filth will smear them. Your future will fill with pricks. He with a fearful heart understands dead. Death will dance on your head. Lift your eyes and see. I am its servant, thirsty from birth. You, my jewels, my raiment. I redden my part, adorn myself for my beloved terrified of evil eye. So with coal, I streak my waterline. Petals shrivel, but thorns stay sharp. Your lips tremor in mourning when you let loose your tresses. Midnight. What place has fear if barbs do not dread withering? Love brings ruin and ruins lives. 
so dramatic, but like so true, right? I mean, I, I, I remember being like a young person and like being totally wrecked by love. Um, and I mean, still, uh, I'm, the, I'm the one that does the calling um, of my partner <laughs> and he's the one that does not call. And currently I'm in Hartford. And actually I just, before the reading, I had this moment where I called him. I'm like, are you okay? Like, where have you been these last few days? So anyhow, <laughs> uh, the next poems that I'm gonna jump into are uh, poems that ha I have all kind of used uh, through mining um, two guides to taxidermy. One is called pra Practical Taxidermy and one is called um, Upland Bird Taxidermy. And these books were uh, really instrumental in thinking of how I can push myself um, into drafts. And then those drafts, on those drafts, I committed heinous acts of erasure to really jumpstart my associative thinking. And so this is actually called preface, using words and phrases borrowed from the preface of Upland Bird Taxidermy, which is the first poem in the book, The Taxidermist Cut. Preface. Let's pretend you are going hunting. You pack a buck knife, a bow, arrows cleft from straight weeds, wild in my front yard. You perch in an oak, yearning for the chill that signals harvest. The copper of pine needles falls. Whether you catch me or not is not the point. Full of me, um, not the point. You look first at wandering deer. The bigger prize, full of meat, with hide to cure. But keep an eye peeled for upland birds too, smaller. Easier to mount once ensnared. You don't need a guide to hollow lungs of song. Yes, I said, birds are easy to work with. Refugee bones that gift flight, delicate, slight, may as well be shadow. I have always made myself invisible. I mean to say, I am still this trembling breath of a comma, this coincidental object of your want. And here is an erasure poem uh, from that same book called Rural Sports. In glade nets stretched across narrows, Riding from tree to tree, for night flying woodcocks or wild ducks lay a trap on the ground. Nets of fine black silk, slack, the bird taken with certainty attempts to pass as whole. I recall seeing two men. One man was let down. The other looked after the safety of the man rope gripping his iron. I have been between heaven and hell once or twice, dared the edge lying upon my breast, the faintest battle between land and sea. Below, guillemots flying off in droves, little black specks in white foam. Um, and that may or may not be a sonnet. Um, maybe it is, but that wasn't intentional. Um, maybe I'm haunted by sonnets. Maybe that's a, a way to think about it. Um, thinking of music and the musical traditions of poetry that I've studied. Um, this next poem I'm gonna call, a uh, read is called Tripline. And it's um, inspired, it, it is also uh, where I've excerpted outside language from a taxidermy field manual. Um, this one is from Practical Taxidermy. Uh, um, and it's also inspired by Ada Limon's Sharks in the River, Sharks in the Rivers, that poem, that, that, that's the like titular poem of uh, uh, Ada's book. I love that poem so much that, you know, in my class, you are, we are definitely going to read it together. So um, this is kind of my version of that. It's called Tripline. In the morning, I say, I don't care if the broken line is my fault. A friend warns me to touch nothing when examining a trail to avoid leaving my scent. 
I say, I have disturbed as much as I could, walked over a mile and never picked up my feet. The trick is to gather enough bedclothes to predict a lover's comings and goings with fair precision. In the dark, string a thread across the trail that leads from the bed to the road. Wedge the thread under a piece of bark or a split twig on the corner of the road and tie the other end to the bedpost. When he strays, the cord will snap. A buck in velvet, I once saw a stag fooled by a hunter's call. I still trip on the clear voice of the first man who scraped my soft casing. I cannot tell from the upturned sand, the drying oak leaves is my own tibia, my crown, my own buckling antler broken. Is the thread snapped by my recurring dream where I string one end to you? and the other to my hatchback and drive off, flooring the damn thing. Thank you, and thank you all for uh, the gift of your presence here today. And I'm so excited to be joining you very, very soon in person. Oh my gosh, in person. Ah, how wonderful. And uh, thank you. Those were wonderful, Rajiv. And I love how creative and all these methods that you have of, um, finding the poem, you know, within all the, where, where it's not expected, I guess. So, and, and making the poem out of that, so cool. And, and everybody just, there are so many threads that went between these poems. So I'm looking forward to our, our next session, a conversation with Richard Carey and Rajiv. So I would, uh, welcome anybody who wants to put some questions in the chat. I'm going to start with a, a plug for the Writers Harbor Poetry Week, because if you haven't already signed up, then you're going to want to after hearing these amazing poets read. It is just go to mainmedia.edu and look up workshops and the Writers Harbor Poetry Week should be easy to find and easy to sign up. And it's a wonderful week of workshops every morning with one of these poets. And then the afternoon, everybody gets a chance to have a craft seminar with each of the three of you. And then there will be evening readings from each of you and a reading from participants at the end of the week. And it's just so much wonderful energy and being here in Maine is beautiful. So I can't wait to have you here, to see you here. And I hope that people are just, you know, floored by your poetry as I am and can't wait to sign up. So. I'm going to start with a few questions, um, and you know, I I thought that um, you just might start by telling us a little bit about writing during the pandemic. I've been thinking a lot about did we learn anything? You know, I mean, some people have struggled with it, called it the great pause. It depends on whether you're an extrovert or introvert, how you reacted, but I wondered how it affected, if it did at all, your creative process, your writing, your poetry, and if there are, are lessons you feel you took away from that time. So I anybody want to start? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Richard. Sure, I might say. <laughs> Um, so if you would have asked me this about uh, two weeks ago, I would have said, not really. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it's interesting how poetry happens in us, right? Like we're not always consciously aware of the stuff we're writing and where, and how it's how we're being affected emotionally. So, you know, in Maine, it, you know, isolation is... <laughs> It's, it's the the daily thing. I live in a town of 2,500 people. Sometimes I don't 
don't see a human being for five days long. So in that sense, I didn't feel that um, um, th that kind of like, you know, being out on the street all day or something like that. But I just finished putting together a, um, a set of new poems for a new and selected book that will be coming out sometime in 25, 32 or something like that. <laughs> and I just realized that all most of these poems had to do with death, <laughs> like, <laughs> like of some kind, right? Like, and then including my own, my own mortality. And I didn't know that that was affecting me in that way. Um, and it was just very surprising to see that. And it was a kind of, not, they're not more of a poem, kind of a letting go, which I think was, was mm. the flip side of, of this pandemic was was just sort of realizing hey i am gonna die you know maybe not of the pandemic but and what do we do with that you know and i'm also 54 so it's right about time for have a midlife crisis <laughs> but they were kind of in a weird way like a kind of i haven't finished yet but it seems like i had to go through this process to then sort of the phoenix the proverbial phoenix out of the ashes kind of thing i was just reading on some of uh, andrew weiss um it was a big main um uh, big part of Maine um had lived in Maine and they found all these drawings that he had hidden away in a neighbor's house that were all about his funeral and like like all these sketches of stuff and then he never showed them to anybody but they started doing some curatorial work and realizing all the paintings that came out of that were really celebratory and so it's almost like he had to kill the self and to be able to like, like sort of get mm. you to have a different turn a leaf or a, a, a second face so yeah it's been affecting me in that way apparently <laughs> wow yeah that's a, a lot to think about and I think sometimes we haven't realized as you said until you looked at this collection of poems how it does infiltrate our consciousness uh, Rajiv do you want to yeah I mean I that's so um thank you for the question <laughs> Oh, sorry. I get distracted very, very quickly. I was like, wait a minute, is something happening? So lots is happening. Um, but I wanted to say also that, you know, during the pandemic for me also, um, I returned, I, I, I went really deep inside to like roots stuff. And so like, you know, the first kind of dabbling in Vedantic philosophy that I did in my early and late teenage years, I've been returning to those um, devotional uh, medieval Indian poets and reading them and then writing these these poems that actually are also um, concerning death um, and destruction um, of the self and like literally of the body, um, you know, com comorbidities. I write a lot about diabetes um, and as a, as a diabetic also like, you know, surviving mm -hmm. a pandemic has been, um, you know, I've been even more careful about uh, you know, exposures and things. As we learn more and more about COVID, it was, you know, for me, what does it mean to then kind of like re-emerge? And I think that my poems are definitely going into that. And I'm, 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 I'm writing these strange devotional poems that are both like to the God without form and also atheist. So it's a, it's a strange kind of paradox that I'm holding in my body, kind of like, bodily precarity as being a thing that I've been like not conscious of writing into, but also something that's been really taken, that's really taken a hold on me. Hmm. It, it sounds like it's had a, a real deepening. Mm -hmm. hmm. Carrie. Well, I mean, I think I, I feel like I am only just now beginning to understand like what happened. It's still unbelievable to me you know and also we have we have two kids you know my son was at the end of the first grade my daughter was at the end of the third grade when fourth grade when this all started happening when this all happened I mean my my I remember very clearly I was in my room working when Friday morning it was the Friday before spring break 2020 and my husband came in and said they canceled school today and I was like, oh man, I had so many things to do before spring break started and now it's canceled and I don't have this, I lost the day. And then my children didn't go back to school for a year. It was wild. I mean, I just can't, I just, when I look back on it, it was, you know, it was something that happened to everyone and to all of us, to the entire world, which felt so heavy and people, people across the world experienced it in different ways. 
And yet for every single person, it was such a, it was a personal experience. Um, and I, I just feel like we're only now coming to understand. One of the surprising things that I learned personally about myself, I was shocked to learn, Meg, you mentioned this. I have always thought of myself as an introvert and the pandemic showed me that I am, I, I'm actually, I'm an extroverted person. I really want to be around people. And I, I was shocked. I was shocked to find out. <laughs> and, and with all that going on and having your kids at home for a year, did you find time to write? Well, I did find time to write. I wrote tons, uh, I because I had to, I was writing on deadline and some, but I also launched my book during the pandemic. Like uh, right before, right in the time in 2020, be, like when no readings and no things in person were happening. And then that I launched my book and then it was like summer and it was like, maybe things will start happening and I can go a little bit on a, do a little tour or something. And then the Omicron variant came and wiped everything out. That was a wild experience too, launching a book during a pandemic. It was like, you know, so many like, you know, turning off the Zoom and just going like, okay, that was my book launch, <laughs> you know. So, but yeah, uh, I did I did a lot of writing, um, but it was hard. My husband and I are both writers and we were both teaching at this time. And uh, it was it was just wild. I still can't believe we survived, but somehow we, we I agree, I agree. I can, you know, it feels unreal in some ways. I launched the Poets Corner in June of 2020, along with my friend, Catherine Seitz, a co-founder of the Poets Corner. And, you know, I, in many ways, I felt more connected to people during the pandemic than before because of the Zoom that allows us to do this with you in Austin. And, Richard in Miami and Rush even Hartford, I think today, you know, it's, it's wonderful. So um, I want to ask you some more questions, but we do have one from the chat from Monique um, asking if you have any poets from the 1960s that are influences. You're all way too young. We're all, <laughs> I, I'm just trying to. I'm trying to do the math here. Um, I should know this, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know how active Elizabeth Bishop was. But I'm, when I say 60s, I immediately think like sort of like different kinds of poets, like like beat poets and stuff like that. Right. But uh, or like the Vietnam War, you know, like. But I would say Elizabeth Bishop is partly she died in 1970 something. But, um, but not necessarily. I, I I don't know if where, where the question is coming from. Like the sixties, like the sixties, like <laughs> like that kind of poetry. <laughs> well, she said she asked because you're all so free and animated, like the Beats. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm gonna tell my husband someone said that about me. Someone called me free and animated. <laughs> tell my kids that they'll never believe it also the, i'm one of my one of my you know influences forever and always and the subject of my kids book um coming out soon these are the proofs of my kids book oh, is ws yeah, merwin right. the poet ws merwin who had a very long career wrote through the 60s um his first book of poems was chosen for the yale younger poets prize by auden and he died only a few years ago so he had a very long career and um, he's a poet who's always been exceptionally inspirational and uh, yeah. And also the, like the poet Lucille Clifton was writing in the sixties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, in some ways I wouldn't say a great influence but someone I've studied um, uh, since graduate school and come back to every once in a while is Allen Ginsberg um, in the sense of um, yeah. Just because it's, I mean, it's approaching the topic of, of America, but also sexuality. And so there's overlap in terms of some of the things that I'm looking at. Um, um, in fact, to write the inaugural poem uh, the, uh, for um, for the for Obama um, is one of the few people that you 
that that you could look at that have that oracular voice and it was kind of an example of mm. what not to write for an inaugural poem <laughs> it's like f you america and you're bot you're adam bomb right it's like oh. but i want to i give me some perspective i i like to read it because it gives me a perspective of what america was like that was dealing with through the lens of a poet um and every time we, i think we're having a bad time i I mean, read Ginsburg. <laughs> like, it's the 60, 68 wasn't a good year, you know. <laughs> so Ginsburg, um, and Ginsburg draws so much from like the Whitman, you know. Yeah, and then there's yeah. a Whitman, yeah, yeah. and then so, and, so there's like there's a lineage there as well. Yeah, I studied uh, Whitman him, and Frost, who I think was in a way creating a kind of folkloric element of America, you know, in its in his own in his own very smaller world but um but um yeah definitely a whitman um whitman um inheritor the 60s right, also hey? saw the um the publishing of um silent spring by rachel carson and so like yep. i think it, like kind of spawned like eco poetry right like poems by um gary snyder have been really influential to me in my thinking as well as Lorraine Nidecker. um yeah, and I think like that's kind of one of the lineages that I would also trace. I mean, it's not quite, uh, and, and then also like Ginsburg, I mean, there's a lot to be said about Howell and all of the remakes and the readings of Howell and um, the ways in which like, you know, we've all probably engaged it in, you know, personal and deep profound ways, but then also really in, in, in very superficial ways for, ways for me, like thinking about what line can do. Um, but then also um, thinking about the connections between the projective kind of poetry and how, you know, Creeley works through line and sound. And like, you know, I am, I'm very interested in the sound of this and like the aesthetics of, um, you know, the eco-critical, which began its kind of like transition um, mm -hmm. from the pastoral in the 60s. And so that's also something that I think about as I write a lot also about whales and um, bi their bioacoustics, so. Nice, nice, that's great. I want to ask each of you um, to talk a little bit about the workshop that you're going to be teaching and your, you know, a little bit about your philosophy of teaching. So, Rajiv, do you want to start? Um, sure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this question. Um, uh, uh, like I said, I am obsessed with the outside material um, in order to jumpstart uh, your own, my own writing. Um, and so the workshop... Uh, idea that I have. Well, first of all, I don't really believe in writer's block. I think that there are so many things that you can do to like get yourself out of thinking so negatively about yourself. Um, a mentor and poet, uh, a mentor of mine and wonderful poet Nicole Cooley uh, used to say to me, um, if all you do all day is write a bad poem, you've had a really good day. Um, and I really love that because it's like about being gentle with yourself, but then also like thinking about what fuses can be sparked for you um, as we as you go through um, the, this, this material. Um, I really like using outside material um, uh, such as taxidermy manuals and all the poems that I've shared today were you know spawned from this kind of thinking and approach uh, because uh, the taxidermy manual because for me at the time when I was writing these poems I was a vegetarian and nothing seemed more distant from my own um, sense of self and also my diction um, than like a manual on taxidermy written in the 1800s. Um, and I was like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna link onto this and see what it can do to push my vocabulary, to push the texture of my language and also thinking about taxidermy more broadly, what can it do to inform line and stanza and all these other kinds of formal concerns. I found that personally, I was able to um, use that as like a jumping off point into that shift into this interior um, speaker self that um, I find to be particularly, you know, uh, interesting in terms of how it interrupts the poem and the logics of uh, this language that is purloined, but then also repurposed. Um, and I think about like poetry in general. I mean, we're so, um, uh, uh, I, I have been schooled to believe, oh yeah, well, is it original? Is it original? When I like get out of my way, and like, and like, I'm literally using someone else's words here, then I don't have that kind of same anxiety as the approach. And so when I approach workshop, it's with that in mind. And this particular one that I'm like thinking of is like using that outside text. And I have like several books actually, I, I've gone out and I've like cleaned out 
my partner, um, who's a historian um, or studying history, his uh, bookshelves and you know my own bookshelves of like strange texts. And I'm gonna be bringing a big suitcase of books uh, for us all to kind of like explore, mine, tear up uh, together. Um, and so that's kind of my what my approach is gonna be. It's gonna be very hands-on, uh, a lot of room for uh, planting seeds uh, and a, a real time in terms of the generation uh, or generating that material for the, the next thing for you. Good thing you're driving up with suitcases full of <laughs> books. Well, that's the beauty about being, um, you know, in a contiguous uh, Wabanaki a Confederacy territory. <laughs> right. <laughs> Love that. Um, Carrie, do you want to take this on next? Yes. And I, yes. Uh, being in person, it's going to be so magical. I mean, you know, I mean, that's all, like, that's, that's one thing in, in this, in this time that I've come to appreciate so much. We are going to read a lot and write a lot. I do a lot of writing together at the beginning of workshops like this, like longer workshops so that we all really feel like held up and that we can trust each other and that we've got each other's backs. Um, and We'll look at craft. We're really going to focus on making on image making um, and approaching our work through that lens. And we'll learn, we'll talk about craft and we'll talk about poems. But I think like something that Rajiv said earlier, like I think that one of the things that um, is so valuable about meeting in person and as a group of poets, as a group of writers, uh, you you can learn about craft reading on your own, really. And writing in so many ways is a self-taught art, like any art. But the experience of being a writer and the things that you kind of need to learn in order to stick with it over the course of a week or a lifetime, um, are really like kind of, you know, they're, they're, they're skills that involve like how you talk to yourself as you, you know, as you're writing and um, how you uh, interpret uh, experiences that might feel like failure and how you can kind of break those open and uh, use them as fuel for for something new. Uh, and so I think those are things that like in person, in a room together um, are so, so, so valuable. And I'm really looking forward to that. I'm just really looking forward to being, you know, in a room with other poets and to have that time. It feels just so luxurious now <laughs> that we've been separated for so long. So that's, um, you know, that's sort of how I'm, uh, that's where I'm coming from. I, I like that idea of how we talk to ourselves. You yeah. know, my, my brother was helpful to me the other day. I said, you know, you get so frustrated at times and you, you haven't been writing poetry that long. So why don't you give yourself that gift of considering yourself a beginner you know yeah. <laughs> that's that's because, okay. I mean, it's also just like when you know when you've been writing for a long time you come to understand that that truly is a gift and that you spend yeah. you know you spend half your career trying not to be a beginner and then you spend the other half of your career trying to get back into the space of that that like you know beginner's mind so yes yes that's great thanks Richard, you want to talk about your workshop? There are so many wonderful things resonating. Um, yeah, like I, like I always say, we spend you know twenty years trying to develop a voice and a style, and then and then I'm like, all my poems sound the same. <laughs> <laughs> like you know, it's like oh, it's it's what's wonderful about art. It always keeps you on your toes, and it's very humbling. Um, and it's always you're always learning something, right? If not, you're not doing something right, as they say. Um, I also just wanted to stop and say I could just tell right now, even on Zoom, the energy between us three is going to be amazing. <laughs> like I just love it. I'm I'm loving it already. Like 
and and there isn't even cocktails out so like <laughs> wait till wait till we're in person and that is that one thing for the workshop that we understand that it's also not just your group and your group and my group but rather that you know we're all going to be having these spaces together and talking about what we're learning in each other's classes and i'm already learning myself from listening to you too i love listening to the craft talks because we never stop learning even as professors right or, or as uh workshop leaders um uh, what I'm going to do, uh, and this is, I've, uh, is kind of what uh, Rajiv was talking about, uh, you know, using periphery materials as sources of photograph. I've always been drawn to photographs. Uh, I think partly because that's the only way that I understood this whole other half of my heritage and my culture and family that was in Cuba. And I guess since I was a little kid, I've always been haunted by photographs, especially family photographs, um, just because I, I, I think there, there's so much to mine there, even, even when you're just looking at a, a, an, art, uh, an art photograph. So we'll be doing that uh, to serve as a prompt in a way. Um, and I have exercise, you know, kind of a walkthrough of like what, you know, how do you pull this out of the, what do you, what is, what's in the photograph? Who's speaking? Who's not speaking? what's in, outside the frame um all sort of relating a lot of the vocabulary that we talk about in craft in the craft of poetry to thinking how how can we pull that from a poem uh, uh from a from a photograph the funner well not the fun part but the fun part also is that then there the, the, the students are will go out and take photos <laughs> um and then they so that the to the idea is to learn that we actually should look with that photographic eye all the time and how do you frame if you have a photo how what do you frame like how do you you know from what angle do you take it and then they have to write a poem about their own photo that they took or about the process of taking the photo so yeah just looking for ways these kinds of peripheral that borrowed way or um ways that we can Speaking of writing the same poem, you know, sort of enliven, bring our own poetry and, and uh, let it be born from other spaces. That's not just like this, you know, just out of uh, out of nowhere, so to speak. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that's it. Um, I think uh, also I will be doing um, some really drilling down on some very core um, uh, pieces, of elements of craft that I think sometimes we get but we don't really get. Um, so what does show don't tell really mean? Let's yeah. really break that down for a minute, <laughs> like because it's just too simple. Oh, show don't tell. Or what the hell is a line break, people? <laughs> so really taking a, a, a microscopic look at some of those craft elements. And as far as more of a philosophy, I think that, um, you know, I think uh, I always think about this thing of the emotional core of a poem or or what is the, the poem's reason for being. Um, um, and just really trying to get to that, what is that essence of a poem and how everything else, once once that is discovered or um, once we trip into that, um, we get rid of all the, the other language that's not doing anything. How do we use language to mine into that subconscious core? Um, and then how, how that to me is how a poem ultimately comes together. So thinking about, um, thinking about that, uh, that that way that um, the very process of poetry is in some ways finding language like fishing like fishing lines down into our subconscious to like raise what we are really needing to say or meaning to say or scared to say <laughs> et cetera et cetera um, so that's more of the philosophical or um, piece mm -hmm. of it or the process piece of it um, yeah um, uh, Rajiv, before I forget, I wanted to ask you, you said the hybrid memoir. What was the name of that? Oh, uh, Anti-Man. Anti-Man? Yeah, yeah, it's a slur in the South Caribbean for a gay man. Oh, okay. Ah. Just curious, because obviously it, I got a project on my hands. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm looking for these kinds of things, but oh, yeah. That's great. I yeah, and, and Richard is a writer and a photographer. I know how great that class is that you offer and and how gifted you are as a teacher. And I look forward to learning from you, Rajiv, and you, Carrie, as well. Um, maybe we should just wrap up with if you want to say a few words about what you're working on now. Um that would be a great way to kind of 
take us out because this has been fabulous. Mm -hmm. Carrie, why don't you get us started? Oh, goodness, okay. Uh, first of all, just finish the book. <laughs> <laughs> no, come on. <laughs> Like my, yeah. Uh, first of all, I wrote down, Rajiv, you said when you were talking about your process of those erasure poems, you said that you engaged in heinous acts of erasure. <laughs> the book I'm working on is called Heinous Acts of Erasure. No, I'm just joking. Oh my God. I was like, oh my God. Whoa. It's, like, it's such a great title. It's like such a great title. I'm actually working on, uh, I'm working on some poems. I'm working on a, a, a longer narrative project but I'm I think the thing I'm most interested and most excited about is I'm working on a book for kids that is like it's called what is work and it kind of just I I have been trying to describe it as like studs turkle for kids <laughs> right, for adults kind of like really um uh thinking with people in their within their their workspace and within their you know workspace like their the space their work takes up in their life and just you know interviewing and asking questions about you know about jobs about what what do you, you know and and i think kids are very 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 interested in that kind of um conversation that isn't kind of like just surface level you know like i'm uh interviewing a cps social worker and like you know talking about you know, sometimes parents, sometimes moms and dads can't take care of their kids and they need help and, and, you know, and then talking about like, well, who pays for social workers and things like that. So that you can really kind of get a sense of like the larger social, you know, implications to jobs and, you know, Very about the social safety net and things like that. And so I just like really, really into this. And that's what I'm sort of most excited yeah. about working on at this particular moment. That's great. Rajiv? Uh, yeah, wow, that sounds really, really, really cool. I have little ones in my life who I would love to give that book to. Um, uh, I'm right now, I am, I just turned in to my publisher, Four Way Press, um, the manuscript of a next, the next book that's scheduled to be published in September of 2023. So by the end of the year, we're going to go into like the deep edited, editing. Um, yeah. and, uh, it's a collection of poems that circles around, um, <clears throat> like I mentioned earlier, excuse me, <clears throat> I'm interested in kind of like an eco-critical aesthetics. Um, what I do is I look at um, Roger Payne, who was um, a cetacean bioacoustician and musician who studied humpback whale song in the 70s. So when National mm -hmm. Geographic published that, that record of humpback whale songs in the 70s that like began the kind of like boycott of the international whaling stuff that happened in the country. Uh, he noticed that whales have a practice of aesthetics um, and that whale songs are broken, humpback whale songs are broken down into units and phrases and arranged into songs. Um, and, I, and I take the poetic, the structure of humpback whale music and I imagine what uh, poetic form can be um, in, in English as I write. And so <clears throat> I'm interested in sound, natural history, and it's just my experimentation with, does this aesthetic do anything for me? And the book might just be a big experiment. And uh, yeah, I, I love whales too, I guess I should say that. You're writing whale poetry. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, well, they're migrant bodies that are dark, that don't believe in national borders. Yeah. So it's also like a huge political project. Yeah. That's wonderful. Richard, what are you working on? Well, I, as I mentioned earlier, I'm uh, just starting to do a, a new and selected and thinking about the new work. Um, but also not just like, let me slap in some new poems. Actually, uh, that, that works as a collection as well. So uh, a themed new, uh, the poems are, the new poems are also sort of like, sort of kind of like a chat book as well, like, you know, connected. Um, that's one thing I have, uh, obviously, um, I've bitten off a lot more than I can chew these days, but one is a memoir. That's why I asked Rashid, but like another memoir that's in my head, but it's about a memoir about something that I never experienced. So, <laughs> okay. but, but that fascinates me. And so it's kind of like almost like ethnography and it has to do with my family history, almost kind of like almost like, like a, a, a 
Danny Shapiro kind of book. Um, I'm not sure what it is yet. Um, that's just involving interviews and all this kind of stuff, a kind of book I've never written before. Um, I'm also uh, in the second stages of a play that is actually was commissioned by um, Portland Stage in, in Maine, in Portland, Maine. And so we'll be doing a workshop and a performance, rehearsal performance next week. And hopefully that will debut sometime at the end of the year or at the beginning of 2023. Um, and uh, it deals with um, cultural issues, uh, identity, et cetera. Um, it's kind of, a, kind of the beginning of a joke. A Cuban, a Cuban moves to Maine and then, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but it's not me, it's not me. It's obviously a character, but obviously based on my experiences and uh, something that it's a very Maine rooted um, um, uh, play. And then I've been doing a lot of really weird, interesting projects with music. And so, um, I'm now, it's just the beginning stages of uh, being a lyricist for a musical uh, based on the book called um, Waiting for Snow in Havana, uh, which is a story of the Peter Pan flight of, the, of children from Cuba that were um, sent away, uh, sent on through a program in the Catholic Church. And some of them never saw their parents again. And there's a big sort of like debate about that, but it's, it's heart wrenching and yet story of an American story in terms of, um, you know, like quintessential better country better life kind of thing um but that's really freaky and scary as i've never been a lyricist and i don't know how to play music so what the hell <laughs> why not um and then the other thing is i've i've gotten a little more into screenwriting so um uh, i'm writing a, a pilot for the memoir that was optioned uh, but they actually ended up hiring me as a co-writer because i don't know all the mechanics of writing a screenplay so um so i'm writing that and then that could now we after you write it and then we have to sell it so <laughs> don't tune on your tv just yet <laughs> it may never get sold but uh it's been a it's been amazing to explore different kinds of writing and how they uh how they're all connected in some ways but also like how they pull at your brain in so different ways so many different ways and like if it's tuesday it must be a memoirist <laughs> if it's wednesday <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, very exciting, uh, but also terrifying. Isn't that the best place to be? <laughs> yes, yes, it is, isn't it? It's the best place to be. This has been so great. Thank you. There is a question about, is that performance open to the public, Richard? And I think they're referring yes. to the play and it will be, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a, like some of the things that we talked about how zoom the positive ends of some of these so they're doing we even do the rehearsals all on zoom and the whole performance is on zoom so if you go to portland state um it's it'll probably be up i'm not i don't know that they have the time at because we're rehearsing next week so it'll be next friday uh the 14th or two weeks from now but check out portland stage maine and I don't, yeah, and it's free and open to the public. And then we, it's great. I've never been through this, but then there's an open forum afterwards because what we're doing is basically, it's kind of like a workshop for a play, except it's the whole performance. And people can chime in and say what they like, what they, what's working, what's not working for them. So if you're, if you're a real thespian, um, it's a little weird on Zoom, but, um, but, it, but it saves a lot of money for a small repertory theater to not have to fly in all these actors and put them up. So, Great. And there's a lot of information in the chat. So if you haven't saved the chat, there's links and all of that stuff. So please save the chat. And I just want to thank the three of you. You have been terrific. I want to congratulate our Poetry Chapbook Contest finalists and honorable mentions and our winner, Jeffrey Bean. Um, and just thank you. This is been great. I can't wait to see you at Maine Media in Rockport uh, at the end of June. And uh, thank you all for reading and being with us today. Can't wait to meet you too in person. I love your work, by the way. Oh my God, I was like, I'm feeling it, baby. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for having us. It was wonderful to hear you guys read. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm so electrified right now. I'm so stoked um, to be in person and to meet you all.
It's great. I am too. <laughs> Thank you. All right, everyone. Bye-bye now. <laughs> Take care. Bye.